Hello, we are back for part three. And I did want to tell you, oh, where well, I did, I was going to tell you about something about Disneyland today. I forgot. I was at Disneyland today. Basically. I know. You told me about your, um, we're talking about the your throat hurting. Oh, yeah. There's something else I want to tell you about it, too, but I forgot. Anyway. Oh, well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, here. This is what it was. Okay, so um, <laughs> I was, we were, we, it was the Food and Wine Festival, um, California Food and Wine Festival at DCA. So that's um, Disneyland California Adventure. And um, we have a pass, a sip and favor pass that we get. And we always get the passes for the festivals because we're crazy. And so we were eating one of our things and we were sitting there talking. And one of the cast members who was sitting, standing next to us was directing people to the Sip and Saver event. Um, like looked at, he looked over at me and he was like, he's like, oh my gosh. He's like, I hope they didn't hurt. They didn't mess with your tattoo. And I'm like, oh no, my tattoo is just fine. He goes, I love your tattoos. And then he said, he's like, he said, look, we're twinsies. <laughs> and he's trying to keep... Oh, that's cute. I'm like the magic is alive. <laughs> the magic is real. <laughs> yeah, that's like, a, that's such a joke too. Cause so then I tell myself, so I said, I said, I leaned over to my son and said, the magic is real. And he goes, mom, that's kind of cringy. And I said, I'm joking because people are always like, it's like a big thing that says people are like, the magic is dead. Like anytime something is like, the magic is gone from Disney. And so then I'm always like, the magic is real. And the magic is there. Um, anyway. Mm, <laughs> okay. Go ahead to yours. <laughs> All right, you have to give me permission. Of course I do. Of, of course. course. I do. Let's see. Um, hold on. That's not how you do it. I don't want to share my screen. Okay, you can share now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, throat chakra. So this is kind of like the blue we talked about last time how um some people get very specific with their color choices associated with the throat or the chakras and some people don't but this is kind of like my color association nice um so we're gonna start with eucalyptus Ooh. um so we should start by saying there are a lot of different uh types of eucalyptus trees. i'm so happy we are talking about this and why? the pictures <laughs> why I'm so happy. Wait, why? <laughs> because there's like, I want to know this. Like I always <laughs> see eucalyptus and I know it's eucalyptus. We have so much eucalyptus here. We so, have tons. Yeah, so or and then I see, and I know that there's a bunch of different eucalyptus, mm -hmm. but I didn't know like why or how, or were they just, were they the male and the female or were they different or what the, yeah. I oh, we're not going into that. It's just okay. like, I mean, we'll go into it a little bit, but there's just a lot of different, it's just like any other plants. It's like the mint family, you know, oh. there's like spearmint and peppermint and like pennyroyal and they're just all part of the same family, but they're just like a lot of, even the leaves are very different. Like if you look at the yeah, wood, I mean. yeah, versus like the silver dollar. It's so weird. Oop, hold on. I got like a, the recording thing. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it is weird though. Um, but what's kind of funky too is the seeds look very similar across all of them, which is interesting. They, and uh, they look unusual. They do look unusual. And you know what? I used to find that when I was in like middle school or something, I used to find them all over like the empty seed pods, which look like this. I used to find them all over and not know what they were. And then I finally, I don't know, somehow like figured it out, but you, they are so common in Southern California that you just see them everywhere. 
And I, ha I hate to even say this because it's going to activate this in me, but like when they're empty and dried out, they activate that like weird phobia with like different holes. Oh, yeah, the they're holes. Horrible. Like, I like, I don't know if you remember it but for a long time when I was, we, I was living in Valley Center. Like, mm. I remember I told you I like had, like, I couldn't stop thinking about that. Like, I had that. Oh, gosh, it was horrible. I know. Uh, that does not bother me at all. I don't have any issues with that. <laughs> horrible that's so funny <laughs> okay so um latin name eucalyptus globulus which is the one that we are going to focus on mostly but it's um different types for different uh, like different species um the folk name though across just eucalyptus in general tends to be gum tree even though there is a gum eucalyptus just as like a general term for eucalyptus is known as gum tree. Um, the parts used typically are the leaves um, and the bark, but the bark is, well, we'll talk about that, but it's mostly used for like tools and stuff. Now um, I gave, so we'll talk about where eucalyptus is from, but it's um, Australia. And so there are a lot of different like indigenous names for different types of eucalyptus trees and stuff. And I'm not even really going to like attempt to read them. But the, I just thought that it was important to give credit where credit is due and talk about like the, or give the indigenous names for them. So that's all of these. Okay, so first things first, the word eucalyptus refers to one like genus of trees, but the word eucalypt refers to like the group or the species that are in different, like um, that are all part of the same. So if we're talking about eucalyptus it's a specific um like genus but if you're talking about eucalypt it's like the the Long, family yeah. essentially yeah so i also want to just squash a myth a lot of people think that koalas are like constantly either drunk or stoned because they eat eucalyptus leaves all the time which is not true um they're um the eucalyptus leaves just contain really few calories and but the koalas that's like their primary diet and so they have to eat a lot of leaves to get the like basically nutrients that they need um and koalas are just naturally sleepy boys they're just they just sleep a lot and so <laughs> they're very I sleepy my little animal so they, they just sleep for 22 hours and then they like barely get enough then they just eat for like a couple hours and then they go back to sleep they gobble so. as much as they can they must yeah. like have like an intense amount of gobbling yes exactly so it's they have, time it's to not, have yeah. sex or poo right <laughs> <laughs> So they, uh, there's this misconception, which I actually thought was true up until I started doing this PowerPoint, um, but misconception. Ooh, okay. So most of the species of eucalyptus are native to Australia. Um, as far as I found, all of them are native to Australia, um, but every like state and territory has its own species. And here in um, America, we only really have it here because they were brought over here. So it is like very native to Australia. Um, so about three quarters of Australian forests are eucalyptus or eucalypt forests. So different types of eucalyptus trees, but um, three quarters. So that's, wow. a, that's a lot of eucalyptus. Oh, wow. um, and then, <laughs> and then um, evidence from DNA sequencing found that or like of the fossils show that the eucalyptus family um, have their roots in uh, Gondwanda, Gondwana, there we go, which is uh, basically like where Australia was um, when it was still connected to Antarctica. So after Pangaea, I have like this little picture, Pangaea, yeah, as yeah. we all know, is like when it was like one continent essentially. And then we started some continental drift and that's when um, Gondwana and like some other land properties had formed um, and now we have today but we see through like DNA sequencing that eucalypt fossils date back to the time of Gondwana wow. so very like wow. ancient old tiny trees 
Um, so something interesting, eucalyptus trees have a natural ability to indicate the presence of gold. They tend to grow in soil where there is gold in the soil. And so um, that's not to say that every eucalyptus is, you know, on, grows on top of gold. However, um, there have been numerous times where um, they started digging under eucalyptus trees or not digging, but they used x-rays under eucalyptus trees and found, yeah, there's gold there. And because the eucalyptus was right on top of it, we wouldn't have really been able to find it using any other methods other than just random digging, which is interesting, but also sad because then a lot of eucalyptus trees were being dug up just in the hopes that there was gold underneath it. There'll be gold in them. <laughs> gold, gold in them hills. <laughs> Um, so the indigenous people of Australia use them for like, um, use the wood to, uh, craft like canoes and bowls and, um, instruments like the, um, didgeridoo, did, I can never say that right. Didgeridoo. Didgeridoo. Didgeridoo, I think it is. Didgeridoo. So this is like that long yeah. instrument that we see in, um, with a lot of just, I don't know, interesting people, but it makes, um, it makes a very specific noise. So yes. If you hear it, you'll always know that. Always know what yeah. it is. Yeah. It's like really deep. It's like yeah. weird. Oh. I kinda, yeah. What? I kind of like it, but yeah, I don't know. Um, so anyways, that I like it. Was... Like, oh, you gotta stop sharing and share it like to make that noise. I was like, I was like, go find it. And um, oh, okay. Hold on one second. Let's see. Let's see. And then, yeah, see if you can find a video of, and then share screen with the audio so we can hear it because you know how it gets all weird where you can't. Well, let me make sure there's no. Of course, there's a exactly commercial here. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. The didgeridoo is a sacred Australian Aborigine uh, instrument. Sorry, I just yes. Of termite mounds, clay. What's that background? Yeah, it's that background music. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Especially the eucalyptus, hollowing them out, like but not. The, end. I think they're showing the musicians themselves. <laughs> okay anyway, yes. so, there's so check out didgeridoo sound that we showed you to hear all about the making of the didgeridoo apparently there's a full you saw just now the full there's a full documentary on the making and the use of the didgeridoo and we just encountered it so i suggest everybody go and check out that dude uh, wow. documentary sounds like it's a lot of fun um. i mean i like a good documentary <laughs> I'm, I'm not being i'm not joshing I'm it is like it's a really interesting sounding instrument actually it is i think i would love to know how they were made and that yeah. looks like it had a full on full on yeah super interesting yeah um, so let's see. Oh, and interestingly enough, they, so you obviously, you need like a hollow piece of the trunk or like a hollow piece, but, um, in traditional, like, crafting, they didn't hollow it out. They waited until termites hollowed it out. Oh. So they made it that way. Wow. So really interesting. Um, but they also use, so the indigenous people of Australia also used it to craft, uh, like weapons. They use the bark of the tree as roofing and then the leaves as bedding. Um, now the Darwell indigenous people used it for, um, like anti-inflammatory activity as well as for their shelter and weapons. And then the, um, Indigenous people also used it for, I don't know why I didn't have this in the medicinal part, but they used it for like gastrointestinal problems. So the gum, which is like the sap or the resin, the gum is just like the excretion from the excretion. Yeah, from the tree. Um, and so that's combined with water and then taken for diarrhea. Also, I want to know that to 
our viewers. Um, Rebecca does not, Rebecca and I often don't share what we're going to be doing. Sometimes Rebecca will tell me the herbs that she's going to be doing just so that I don't double up, but I don't look into hers and she doesn't know which ones I'm doing. And there's so much tying in, tying them together every week. Like the diarrhea, we're going to talk about um, the abortifacients. It's just really interesting. Brad. I just want to note that. I love that. <laughs> Um, okay, so eucalyptus trees are really deeply connected to um, Aboriginal. So Aboriginal um, people are were like the native um, Australian people and the Torres Strait Islanders people. So I just give you a little map just so that you could see where the Torres, Torres Strait Islands are. So this is Cape York in Australia and this is the Torres Strait Islands. So right off the Australian coast. I mean, like right there. Um, and so both people, the um, Aboriginal people and the Torres Strait people um, use eucalyptus as a connection for like spiritual practices. Um, and so the leaves are burned usually in smoking ceremonies. And then the smoke is used as um, like a, a cleanser, kind of like smudging with sage. They would like smudge with eucalyptus, which is really interesting. I've never used eucalyptus as like a smudge, but it totally makes sense if you think it does. It. it does. Um, what a great idea. I love that. And idea. I wonder if you could even make like bundles, like eucalyptus Ooh. leaf bundles. Mm. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. I know because we have so much eucalyptus everywhere. I mean, yeah. it would be very hard. To, like, well, oh, what together. if you made a bundle using leaves from different types of eucalyptus trees? Oh, like mm. a varietal. Yeah, that the sounds eucalyptus good. varietal. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so they use it for people and spaces, just like we would do, like with sage and Palo Santo and like cedar and any other cleansing um, herbs. Now, many eucalypt, um, have adapted to wire wild fire. And it actually has this really cool property where they re-sprout very easily in, um, like charcoal areas and like post brush fire areas. Um, and there's some like evolutionary theory of like why that would be because there were a lot of wildfires in Australia. So but what about this most recent one? Are you going to talk about that? Um, I'm not going to talk about that. No, but yeah, it would be interesting to see like how the eucalyptus trees are doing now. Cause it's been a couple of years. When was that? I don't know. 2021 maybe. Yeah. Hold on. Let's see. Hold on. Yeah. Let's see if they... I don't know in it 20 let's see Twenty twenty. okay 2020. I just remember that video of like the burnt koala I remember in that woman like draping her shirt yeah like I wonder though if it's like the I'm sh so that's in four years later mm. so um Australia let's see wildfire regrowth i'm interested to see hmm. yeah it, but there the problem is though is that it was so devastating so but it it looks like there is regrowth and in the same way that you say like it mm -hmm. looks like from the pictures that i'm looking at it looks like there's it's like like it actually like regrows like like there's like a burned out like trunk and then the green actually regrows in the middle of the burned trunk like it yeah. sprouts out of the burned trunk like it, it I can even show you this picture here like like yeah. I don't even know if you can see that like idea like oh, kind of yeah kind of like see like how the trunks mm -hmm. there's like stuff coming out of the trunk yeah they, it, it, they really like charcoal. So, I mean, if you have soil that is like that heavy in charcoal components, and then the tree can continue to grow through this charcoaly burnt out hollow trunk, that sounds like a good thing for it. So it seems like something you would seek out. So that totally makes sense. Um, so the seeds survive the wildfire typically, and then it's just easy for it to regrow. So yeah, it's very interesting. We'll circle back to that. 
Okay, so there's a lot here, but I thought that it was really um, a really good point. So there's this professor who is um, from the like um, Aboriginal um, Indigenous Australia people. She's a professor. Um, and she says that in English, we give things very static names. And then what's uh, what something is known as is what it's always is. But from an Aboriginal point of view, trees and plants get different names at different times of year. The historical records from Sydney area give us a snapshot of what something was called at that particular time. And quite often the name will be about the kind of thing that it does at that time. I don't see why we should see trees as being one word wonders. They're much more than that, which means that um, trees and animals um, and other plants have different names according to the seasons. Uh -huh. um, so the name will represent like whether it's flowering or not, if the um, seeds are being dropped, like what animals are like associating with that plant at that point in time, which I thought was really interesting. That's not specific to eucalyptus, but I did really like that um, a lot. I like that too. Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, okay, so um, the for Australians, like Aboriginal people used it for healing for a very long time. And then eventually the Europeans recorded its medicinal benefits. Um, so because it is from Australia, obviously the Australian people were using it for a long time. But then we started getting like the medicinal uses from like the Europeans who stole it from them and stuff. So in 1778, uh, surgeons of aboard British ships recorded its use by indigenous people for wound healing um, and cleaning, wound cleaning, because it had antiseptic properties. Um, so the leaves can be crushed up and used as antibacterial poultice um, or held under the nose to relieve nasal congestion. So you can kind of like just get some tree, some trees, some leaves. I like to just kind of like tear them up a bit to release those oils and then like smell them. And it's good to help with your congestion. Um, when burned, they're good for warding off flies and other insects. Um, it was sometimes known as fever tree uh, because the sap and the bark were used to treat fevers and like respiratory tract infections. Um, and then you can boil the gum, which we talked about already in water. And then once it's cooled, use it as like an ointment. Um, or you could just like take the still wet tacky like sap from the tree and use that as ointment for cuts and sores. Um, and then a sap is also used for upset stomach. Now, magically, the eucalyptus tree, like we talked about, is seen as kind of like a holy or a sacred tree for a lot of indigenous Australian people. Um, and for some of them, it represents the division between the underworld, the earth, and the heaven. Um, and there was a lot of association about it being reborn out of fire, which is like the connection, like the bridge between the underworld and like earth, because it's being reborn from that. Um, and then leaves are soaked in water to produce some type of like medicinal infusion. Um, so eucalyptus is used to bring fresh energy into a situation. Um, I don't really necessarily see it as bringing fresh energy, I guess, but I do see it as like a cleansing, like, oh, your nose is stuffed up, just sniff some of that and it'll drain you right now. <laughs> Get rid of that. Um, it also is supposed to help heal like regrets and worries that you have and relieve mental exhaustion. Um, it's an excellent herb for when someone is bothering you again, tied to like an annoying, like cold that you have. And then you can like smell the leaves or drink the infusion. And then it gets rid of that, like buggy cold. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then correspondences are air or water and then mercury and Venus. Now I want to make a note um, that I, I haven't really found, everywhere that I looked, these are the magical uses that I found, which I agree with. I agree with like the cleansing and stuff like that. However, I think that something has been gravely overlooked. I think that they're not being any magical associations to rising from ashes is problematic because I think that that is like such a powerful thing and nobody talks about it. I haven't been able to find that anywhere. The persistence. So, yeah. And like, 
after something like the tower card, right? After you have some type of like something destroyed in your life, some type of downfall and like upheaval and you feel like just like after a fire, you feel burnt out, you feel like there's nothing left. And then to bring in something that can help those seeds that are still there regrow, I think would be very powerful. And I don't- It goes with the other herbs that we've been talking about tonight. Of course, we yeah. not, that's so weird. I exactly. Don't... I can't believe that nobody talks about that. It's kind of baffling to me. That so. is baffling. Well, we're talking um, about it. So there you go. Yeah, there we go. So that's eucalyptus. And then next- we have penny roll. Ooh, now, right. I did not find much on the history. I didn't find any like lore really associated with the eucalyptus other than like the indigenous like usage, but not really any lore. Um, and penny roll is kind of the same. The, what I found with penny roll was all centered around um, like one thing, which we'll talk about. But the Latin name is mentha plugium. The parts used are the aerial parts, folk names, Penny Royale, um, Polygium, Run by the Ground, Lurk in the Ditch, which I love, Pudding Grass, um, Pilorial, uh, Penny Real Mosquito Plant. Now, the um, Polygium was named by Pliny, or Pliny, who we talk about quite often, actually, um, and it's because it was used to drive away fleas. Um, pluix in Latin being fleas. So that's like where we get the, the name plu, pluigium. And then pudding grass because it was used as a stuffing for hogs pudding. And if you're not aware, hogs pudding is a type of sausage where they put meat, fat, which is typical, but also um, bread and oatmeal or barley in the sausage. And so they would often put penny royal in there for like flavoring. Penny royal is very, it's a part of the mint family. So it's very minty, but it's not like peppermint it's almost kind it's, of it's I, weird it, I, yeah. I don't know, are you gonna eat that it's like a it's almost like medically yeah I was gonna say it's kind of like a mix between peppermint and spearmint with the added taste and smell of a bit like coppery I I am for something there's like something like really yeah. like like aggressive about yeah. it too like I feel like it smells aggressive it does there's but like I something... love it <laughs> yeah like you either love it or I I love it I like it too I don't love it like you but I enjoy yeah. it it's not a yeah. bad smell for me yeah it, it's an interesting smell it's one you probably haven't I suggest people seek out penny royal to smell because it's one you just haven't smelled a lot. You, you're yeah. like, it's going to be very, it's a fun new smell. Yeah. I, I think that I would enjoy it as like a toothpaste or something. I mean, oh. I wouldn't like use it as such, I guess. I don't know about the cleansing huh. properties, but, but, but I would like, yeah, I kind it of, could be a, yeah, it could be a toothpaste. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Anyways. Okay. So the big thing it's known for is an abortifacient, which we love. <laughs> well, that's perfect. That's why I had more to say about that anyway. I know. <laughs> so we love our abortifacients. Um, okay. So pretty much all the history that I'm going to talk about is associated with it being an abortifacient. Perfect. And again, there's not really much lore, but we'll talk about some. So contraceptive properties, it was um, referred to in a joking manner by um, our Artistophanes play, which was called Peace in 421 BCE, where the god um, Hermes provides uh, the trigeos. Um, a female companion and, and then when Trigeos says well like what happens if she becomes pregnant like will there be a problem and Hermes says no did not if you give her a dose of penny royal because it's an abortifacient so it's going to it's like a birth control or contraception I should say it's like after um, like plan b yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, so something to note, the chemicals in pennyroyal plant cause uterine lining to contract, which is why it can bring on menses, which is why it's an abortifacient. So obviously I put in a big old slide, like it's an abortifacient. So avoid if you are pregnant and want to keep the pregnancy. 
Um, but if women struggle with uh, their menstrual cycle, like if they have cystic ovary syndrome, or um, if you are um, sometimes when women get off of birth control, they are, it takes a while for their like period to come back. So if you're trying to bring on your, your period, part of your menstrual cycle, then, um, penny royal like infusion is supposed to be a good way to go. Um, something to note though, the oil, which is like the more concentrated form, it's a very, the oils in general, herbal oils are just very concentrated forms. Right. And so the concentrated forms, uh, like the oils are kind are toxic, um, and they can force a miscarriage if ingested, which we love. But there's also can be like problematic, where um, it can be not good for like your liver and yeah. a couple of, which. Yeah, I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, so in general, as with all herbs, neither one of us are doctors or physicians or like psychiatrists. So you know, like take this with a grain of salt and like consult your doctor. But um, you might want to, I think that pennyroyal is fine in an infusion. I've drank it in infusions before, um, but I would avoid like higher concentrated forms. I probably wouldn't make it into a tincture. Um, I mean, it could be fine, but I usually just drink it as an infusion. I think I would consult a, um, a, um, a what's it called? A, um, a nap naturopath or something uh no I wasn't even gonna say a naturopath I was gonna say like a um like I don't know if the women that deliver babies without like oh like midwives like midwives still know about these herbs but perhaps a midwife or perhaps like a natural I don't know if a natural maybe a naturopath but I'm thinking more like they don't like you want like a ditchy witchy like you want like to talk to Susan Weed. <laughs> you want yeah. you yeah. want to talk to somebody who knows a lot about herbs and a lot about like 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 the old. You would if I like had an if I were in a state and you know what and I had an unwanted pregnancy and I didn't know what to do and I didn't have the money to go to another state or oh, wait let me make this worse. How about if my daddy raped me? How about that? How about my daddy raped me and I'm in a state that doesn't allow me to have an abortion and I don't know what to do. Well, I'd, I'd look for my local who used to be like a midwife, like witch doctor. That's who was the, that's why they were imprisoning these women is because they knew both about all this stuff. Okay. You need to find somebody who knows a lot about this stuff. Okay. Because it's not me. The point is, it's not me. We're just regurgitating. Yeah. If we hear something, we're taking note of it because we realize in the state of affairs as such, we better take note of it. Yeah, 1000% agree with you. I was just saying that yeah. what whether or not you're using it for like an abortifacient, either way, ingestion of the oil or concentrated forms could be problematic. It's still, yeah, okay. Regardless, it could be yeah. a you need to yeah. be, that's why you need to be careful. That's why exactly. you need to talk to somebody who's more smart. Yeah, exactly. Talk <laughs> to somebody who knows about like the chemical compositions because like I said, I drink it in an infusion, like for you know, magical reasons or not. Um, I drink it there. I mean, it's it I like the taste, so I'll put it in my infusions, but um, I'm going to avoid it. I mean, maybe if I'm really desperate, I would take it in an oil form, but again, it could harm your body. So just be careful yeah. with any like concentrated forms. There you go. Um, so here's more information on that. Um, it's toxic because of um, this, I don't even know, cyclohexanon polygon. Uh, that is the toxic chemical, like um, when you're taking it in high concentrations. Um, so like I said, I drink it in infusion, but you know, to each their own, be safe. I don't want like anybody drinking a bunch of this and having like some type of negative reaction. Um, so just keep I that have, in mind. I have a ton of this stuff and like, I, so do I. it um, smells really good. It's just, it smells it, so it, good. Yeah. And I do make like a homemade bug spray. 
That's such um, a good idea. Because yeah, we get a lot of mosquitoes here in like the early part of the winter when everything gets really wet. Um, and so I make like a bug spray, which I really like, but I also like the taste, but I don't do a lot. I just do like a little pinch. And so, because I just use so little of it, I, I just have a ton of it. <laughs> um, okay. So then we have, um, Metadora, who is a Greek physician, a female Greek physician, mind you. Um, and so she would mix penny row with wine to induce abortions. Um, then we have Pliny again, and, um, he described it as an amenagogue that also helped expel the dead fetus. Um, and then Roman and Greek writers, uh, both agreed that when served with tepid water, they said, so not wine, but water was an effective abortive method. So we have that it is a good uterine contractor, uh, throughout like history, honestly. So it's been known to do that for a while. Now, we discussed the Illusion Mysteries on our first time. I don't even know if we recorded that, but for the Root Star Chakra. We did. Um, or sorry, not the Earth, Earth Star. The Earth Star Chakra. We, we discussed it. And okay, cool. And um, what my herb or plant there was mushrooms. And we just talked about mushrooms in general, but we talked about mushrooms associated with the illusion and mysteries. And so how that was, it was like a set of rites that was a multi-day festival um, where people showed like the tale of Demeter and Persephone and uh, like told the um, Homer's hymn to Demeter. Like that was what it was all centered around and how it's held like once a year over nine days and so on and so forth. So um, when the, um, at the last day of the mysteries, there was an all night vigil, which commemorated Demeter's search for Persephone. And we talked about in the Earth Star Chakra, how they would drink this special drink called um, Kaikion. And it was a mix of barley and pennyroyal. Now we talked about it um, in the form of ergot and how there was like the barley um, like fungus that was believed to produce LSD like effects. Look at that. I also forgot a parenthesis. <laughs> yeah, <you missed> that. <laughs> and I um, that. We're both yeah. <laughs> So that's why we talked about it earlier, but I just wanted to bring that up again because it would be mixed with pennyroyal. Nice. So medicinally, um, it's a carminative, diaphoretic, a stimulant, a menagogue, antiseptic, nervine, and an abortifacient. Oh, nervine in small qualities, quantities, and an abortifacient. Um, it helps relieve indigestion and nausea, just like most of the mint family. Um, it relaxes spasmodic pain. So if you're having like a muscle spasm, it can help, helps with anxiety, which is why it's like, an, or because it's a nervine, um, insect bites and wounds. Um, it's also said to help fix um, like color irregularities. Like if you have sunspots, it's believed that you can make like a poultice out of it, uh, pinna oil and salt actually, and it's supposed to help. Um, it's also good for colds because it helps induce like perspiration. So it helps like break your fever. Um, and then you can also burn it and then apply the ash to your gums to like strengthen your gums. Okay, so magically it's used in like spells and sachets. Um, it said that you can put pennyroyal in your shoes to help protect you from tired feet. Um, it helps relieve blockages of the show, the throat chakra um, and help your aura if you have damage um, because of like any type of addiction, not just like drug addiction, but any type of addiction, spending money, like whatever. Um, and then it's also said to protect against the evil eye. Now, um, it is of feminine nature, so it's ruled by Venus and the element Earth. Now, some people say it's masculine. We've got one minute. Which, oh, okay. So some people say it's masculine, which I completely disagree with, obviously. Obviously. Um, yeah, I, yeah, come on. And then it's associated with <laughs> fertility, fertility goddesses because of, like, the uterine contraction. So Demeter, Isis, Oshun, Freya, Circes, and, like, any type of fertility goddess. And that's it. Perfect. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Under the water. Yay. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's rad. Yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah. 
it's gonna be end. It'll end, and then that'll be that. I know. <laughs> we'll talk about next week. It will be the uh, third eye. Third eye. I know. I've got ideas for what to do after this too. Ooh, nice. I know. So we'll talk about that too next week. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Awesome. See so you later. Come up with some ideas. Exactly.